got uh, these wonderful volunteers who are, uh, have their mics and, and they're going to come up so that uh, I can hear your question. This young man right here, who, who had their hand up right, right here? This gentleman. Introduce yourself to him. Daniel Reams, sir. In 2009, the Center for American Progress sponsored the National Clean Energy Project, which they detailed the implementation of an efficient, high-voltage grid that would extend from coast to coast. Now, our particular product can only apply to so many mountains, valleys, and regions, before we run out of space. It's critical that this grid be established so we continue to grow these green color jobs and maintain this product within our American shores. What's the current level of appropriations being provided for this particular endeavor? How high a priority is it for your current cabinet? That was a good question there. Okay. Uh, uh, is, is that how he talks all the time? Man. I better take off my jacket. All right. that, 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 was, uh, that was serious. Now listen, uh, it actually was a great question. Uh, I, I think a lot of you guys are aware, you know, there's some places, you know, say the Dakotas, where it's flat and you just got a lot of wind. But you may not have a lot of customers. Uh, and so the question for wind power and solar power and a lot of these renewable energy uh, industries is if we're producing the energy in one place, how do we get it to another place? And that's why this whole concept of a smart grid is really important. And, and, and a smart grid is just a fancy name for a better electricity grid than what we've got right now. Because uh, the, the way it works right now, we've got this patchwork of all these different electricity grids and connectors. And there's all this leakage. And a, a bunch of it was created, you know, decades ago. So it, it's not particularly efficient. And so the idea of a smart grid is if you can hook up a national electricity grid that is state of the art and it has uh, switches and uh, uh, computer monitors that are, are able to help regulate the flow of electricity to the places that need it when they need it, then you can save huge amounts of electricity which means that uh, your bills are lower. It means that we have to produce less uh, energy per household or per business, which means we're sending less pollution into the air, whatever form of energy we're using. It means that renewable energies like solar and wind now have an advantage because you can get them from where they're being created to where they need to go. And because it's more efficient, there's less waste. So you can actually store wind energy even when it's not windy, or solar energy even when it's not sunny. So this is a huge and important project. It turns out that the challenge is not so much uh, a money issue. When you said appropriations, you know, the question was, you know, does, you know, are, are we going to, is Congress going to put a lot of money into building this thing? It turns out actually that you could probably get a lot of private sector dollars to invest in a smart grid. The big challenge is actually all these different zoning laws because people don't want transmission lines, etc., in their vicinity and each state and each local government has its own control about siting issues. And so you've got this patchwork instead of one national concept. So what I've been trying to do, and this wouldn't cost a lot of money, is just to get uh, governors, mayors, county officials, federal uh, government, all to sit down and figure out how can we get this done? How can we get this done? And it may start just in certain sections of the country. So you'd have a smart grid in, let's say, you know, uh, the upper Midwest. And then you'd have another smart grid uh, in the Northeast. And you know, you kind of build these patch, bigger patchworks and then you kind of stitch them all together at the end. We should be able to get this done, uh, but it's going to require some organization and it requires cooperation from each of these different uh, units of government that we've got right now. All right?
Okay, and, and uh, if you want to be a TV commentator, you let me know. <laughs> All right, who, who's next? Who's next? Gentleman right here. How are you doing, Mr. President? I'm good. Uh, my name is Jazz. Uh, you were talking about the rise of gas prices. Uh, is there anybody that uh, talks about uh, lowering the prices? I mean, I know back in the 70s when we had this uh, conflict, uh, they were going from uh, our license plates from IBE. I know we're not at that stage right now, but they did lower the prices after that. Is there a chance of the price being lowered again? Well, let me, let me uh, go over what I, I said a little bit earlier. Most of the reason the gas price spiked three years ago was demand for oil increased. Then what happened was we had the terrible recession. A lot of businesses closed, a lot of folks were out of work, folks were driving fewer miles, so demand for oil goes down, prices went down. And by the way, oil prices are worldwide prices. So you don't just have like a U.S. market for oil, you've got a world market for oil. Anything that happens anywhere in the world will lower the price. So now the economy's picking up, which is a good thing. More folks are finding jobs, businesses are starting to hire again, and that's happening all around the world. So now you're starting to see demand go back up, and the prices are going back up. You add on top of that what's happening in the Middle East, and it makes folks nervous. And so these folks start saying, you know what, I'm going to bid a higher price on oil, on a barrel of oil now, because I'm thinking it's going to go up, up a little further in case something happens uh, on the world oil markets. And that pushes prices up just a little bit more. Now, there are a couple of things that we can do. But I'm just going to be honest with you, there's not much we can do next week or two weeks from now. What we can do is, for example, increase oil production here in the United States. So we are out there. Uh, here's a little secret for you. We actually have seen higher oil production here in the United States than any time in our history. We are producing a lot of oil, it's just demand keeps on going up faster than production. But we can still do more. Now, we just had the Gulf crisis last summer when everything was messed up. And so what I had to do was I had to say, you know what, before we start drilling again out there, then I want you guys to show me proof that you can actually do this safely and when something goes wrong, you can cap that thing. So we're not going through six months of oil just spilling into the ocean and ruining coastal communities and you know, hurting fishermen and so forth. We now have a situation where the safety rules have been approved and drilling is beginning again in that region, but the drilling that's taking place in the Gulf now, you know, that product doesn't get to market right away. We're also saying, you know, let's look at places like off the Atlantic or uh, in Alaska. If there are other places where we can do some offshore drilling, we'll do it. But here's the thing about oil. We have about two, to maybe three percent of the world's proven oil reserves. We use 25 percent of the world's oil. So think about it, even if we doubled the amount of oil that we produce, we'd still be short by a factor of five. So we can't just drill our way out of the problem. And that's why the second thing we can do is increase efficiency on cars and trucks, which is where most of our oil is used. Now, I noticed some folks clap, but I know some of these big guys, they're all still driving their big SUVs. You know, they got their big monster trucks and everything. You're one of them? Well, now, here's my point. You know, if, if you're complaining about the price of gas and you're only getting eight miles a gallon, you know, well, I, I, you may have a big family, but it's probably not that big. <laughs> so, I mean, you have 10 kids, you said? 10 kids? Well, you definitely need a hybrid van then. <laughs> but 
But here's the thing is, is that uh, last year, for the first time in 30 years, we increased fuel efficiency standards on cars and trucks. And we didn't do it, by the way, with a law. We got auto workers, auto companies, environmentalists, everybody agreed to it.